Today, I'll be taking a look at this vehicle here. It's the latest entry into the electric segment here in Trinidad and Tobago. But first, let's get the pleasantries out of the way. Great Wall Motors. They are the manufacturer of this car. That is what GWM stands for. Some of you may be familiar with this brand. They used to sell pickup trucks here long ago. Now they are back. Now under Great Wall Motors, they have a subcompany called Aura. So just think of Aura like how Lexus was a subcompany under Toyota. Right, this is their electric division. And this is the Aura. In some markets, it's called the Aura Funky Cat, but I think we are just calling it the Aura down here. Now, this is an all-electric vehicle, meaning there is no internal combustion engine on board whatsoever. This particular model comes with a 63.1 kilowatt hour battery, which is pretty big for a vehicle this size. And it also only takes about, let's say, seven and a half hours to charge. Or you can rapid charge it in about 50 minutes time. Now to give a better understanding of what the dimensions are of the Aura, I had to find a vehicle that was close in size but also well known by the public in Toronto Tobago. And I came up with the Kia Nero. Most of you know what the Kia Nero is. So I'm going to compare it in terms of dimensions to the Kia Nero. Head to head dimensions, the Kia Nero is 60.8 inches high while the Aura is 63.1 inches high. The Kia Nero is 171.5 inches long while the Aura is 166.7 inches long. When it comes to width, the Kia Nero is 71.1 inches wide while the Aura is 71.8 inches wide. In terms of weight, the Aura is coming in at a curb weight of 3,483 pounds while the Kia Nero is 3,807 pounds. So the Aura is lighter than the Kia Nero. So for the rest of this review, if you're looking for a size comparison in your mind to compare it to something, it's a slightly shorter Kia Nero in terms of length, but it's taller and just a smidgen wider. Up front, you have two different cameras. This first one up here by the rearview mirror handles things like your adaptive cruise control and your other safety tech. And this one at the bottom here to the front on top of your license plate, this is part of the 360 camera system. Now looking at the front, you observe very quickly there's no grill in front there. No grill, it's completely enclosed. And that is also because, again, it's an all-electric vehicle. There's no radiator fan in there. Coming around to the lights, you have all LED headlights and then you have intelligent lights written on each side. Just to remind you, it has intelligent features. Now taking a closer look at the front again as you can see it's completely closed up electric vehicles often have a minimalistic front because that giant radiator grill that internal combustion engine cars can play around with and make fancy designs it's literally a seal it creates wind resistance it drags your fuel economy down to the ground but it's needed because without it your internal combustion engine will quickly overheat electric vehicles don't have a need for a giant radiator fan to the front there so they can afford to close up that entire front piece at the rear, you will notice that there's an absence of a tailpipe, obviously, it's an all-electric vehicle. But if you look closely, you will also notice something really strange. There are no tail lights or brake lights in its conventional location. They actually move that to the top up here by the sliding bar. So you have this lighting bar that runs along the bottom of the rear glass and then above that you have what we would normally call the third brake light which is located right below the spoiler and on top of that a shark fin antenna and on the tailgate you have aura written big and then you have gwm to the right you also have a rear backup camera located right here and then this little light at the bottom here as well now when it comes to trunk space how to visualize this is that with the seats up you have less trunk space at the rear here than in Suzuki Swift. You only have 228 liters, whereas in Suzuki Swift, you have 265 liters with the seats up. However, when you fold the rear seats down, you have more space than a Suzuki Swift. Because Suzuki Swift only have 579 liters with the rear seats folded down, while this has 858 liters with the rear seats folded down. So it's a give and take. It has more when the seats are down, but less when the seats are up. And no, you do not get a spare tire underneath here. You get a tire repair kit, you get an inflator. This thing here is the plug that you're going to use to charge your vehicle at home. And that's about it. Apparently, spare tires are a thing of the past. Get over it. What you do get is a fire extinguisher. Something that all vehicles, I think, should have. Here, you have a single LED light. I'm not sure how bright it is at night, but it's an LED, so most likely it is bright. Like I said before, the rear seats do fold down. Now, in this version, it's a manual tailgate, but there is a GT version that has an auto tailgate or a power tailgate, which will open and close for itself. Now, let's take a look at the interior of the vehicle. And this would be a pretty good time to point out the different colors. If you observe that I had different vehicles, I started with the green, and then I went across a blue. Each vehicle has a unique color on top. And the color on top matches whatever color the interior is. For example, you are seeing black here. And that's because the light blue has a black top. So the black interior. The beige next to it has this brown finish on top. And the interior for that 
would be brown on the inside. And then the green inside the showroom comes with a green and white interior. It's not really white, white. It's more of a type of creamish white, but this is what it looks like. You have leather seating front and rear, fully powered front seats. The passenger gets four-way power adjustments, while the driver gets six-way power adjustments. These seats are really comfortable though. They, re they are really comfortable and they have a type of retro look to them. If you are into that, you would really love this. Me personally, I'm not really a fan of the green. I love the inside of my vehicles to be black. So let's go across to the light blue and check out the black. In terms of soft touch materials, the interior here is well put together. You don't get soft touch materials to the top here. On top here is hard plastic, or what they call scratchy plastic. But you do get soft touch materials in the center here, and you can see I'm pushing it in. It has some nice plate to it. It's really nice. And on top here as well, soft touch material around here, and then you have a kind of brushed metal, but a wooden finish over here. At the bottom, Hard plastic once more. Now, once you step inside the Aura, you quickly realize that they maximize all the floor space inside here. This is with the front seat all the way pushed back and the top half tilted back way past the B pillar, as you can see here. And my knees are barely touching the back of the seat. This is what you call a clunker. You know, you watch a clunker and you realize, but oh, wait, it looks small, but like 50 clunks came out of it. Right. It looks small on the outside, but you have enough room on the inside. It's not small on the inside whatsoever. Now, remember, I also said that it's a bit taller than the Kia Niro and that really shows when you sit in here you realize that the top, the headliner is a bit higher than you would expect especially given the size of the vehicle from the outside you get in here and you think you're going to be claustrophobic and you're not going to be claustrophobic regarding connectivity at the rear you have a single USB output for power so you can charge your phone or tablet or whatever other USB power device you have at the rear here now it doesn't say if it's a fast charging outlet or not but given the fact that this is an electric vehicle after all I would be shocked if it's not a fast charging outlet. Stepping into the front of the vehicle now, it has one of my favorite but most basic features. One touch up down. I don't understand why all automakers don't implement this feature. You touch it, you let go. That's it. And all four windows are one touch up down. Not just the front, not just the driver, all four. Love this. But let's take a closer look at the interior to the front. Let's see what the front has to offer. And I can tell you, it's actually well built. You know, you think that as a Chinese vehicle, there's going to be creaks and rattles and things out of place and misaligned gaps and stuff. But it's not that. It's not that. For example, the top there, you saw me touching it. Soft touch material. It has a suede finish. You pass your hand over it and it goes like... Shh, shh, shh. A nice suede finish. This entire dash here seems like it's one piece. If it's not, they hit the seams pretty well. So it's just like one solid piece. In fact, this entire interior seems well built. You know, I'm poking around, I'm prodding around. And everything just seems like... Yeah, they knew what they were doing when they did it. Over here, you have a glove box that opens within two business days. It's like the slowest stampman I have ever seen. You can quite literally look at your glove box open before it's fully opened. But it's a brand new vehicle, so maybe if you use it a couple hundred times, it's going to open a bit faster. But for now, yeah, you got to make a turn and come back while it's opening. Here you have a standard 12-volt outlet, what we typically call a cigarette lighter over here. Next to that, you have a power outlet for your USB, and then you have your USB for your USB connectivity. Above that, you have these controls, which has a kind of retro look to them. It's not like touch. This is a touch. You can touch it to turn your hazards on. But then the others are like little like switches you flick up or you flick down. and they are really basic switches they don't really handle the heavy lifting most of the heavy lifting is handled by these touch screens on top here well this one in particular but these buttons are like for basic things like your defog on off fan speed high low or to turn the ac on or off this is what your gear shifter looks like as you can see when you have three options there well aside from park so you turn the dial you have reverse neutral drive and you push down the center to get park and it must be noted that flickering that you are seeing there by park neutral drive that isn't something to do with the vehicle. That's a common issue when recording LED bulbs in particular. And it has to do with the frame rate I'm recording and causing that flickering. Underneath the gear dial, you have your electronic park and brake and your auto hold feature. You push that and the car will stop. If you are stopped on a hill, you can take your foot off the brake and the car won't roll back. You also have a wireless charging pad here. So if you have a phone that has wireless charging, you can just rest it here and it will wirelessly charge while you drive the vehicle. You have a center console here. And it's a bit of a give and take because it's narrow but it's deep. So you can put something that is long in there but not too fat. And on top, you have your soft touch material. This is where your elbow will go. We call it the armrest, but technically it's just the cover for the center console. And this is one of the places you don't want hard plastic because hard plastic here will tend to hurt your elbow over a long period. So soft touch material there is a must. You don't get a vanity mirror on the passenger side sun visor, but you do get one that is on the driver's side sun visor. Up here, you have your lighting controls, just two buttons. 
This one turns both lights on and the other one turns both lights on when the doors are open. This here is your shield holder. I don't think most people use this, but this here, if you're one of the few who actually use a shield holder, it's there. This is the second button. You can turn this on or off. This is still let the vehicle know the door is open. I just want to turn the lights on like it's doing now. But there's no way I can tell it turn one light on. Like if you don't want all that light, it's either all or none. As I said, the driver's side does have a vanity mirror, but it's unilluminated, so you can use it maybe in the daytime or if you have your own light source. Now, those with a keen eye would realize that at no point in time anywhere in this video so far have you seen a start-stop button. And that's because it doesn't have a conventional start-stop button. How you start it, once you have the keys on you, you get into the vehicle, you hit the brake pedal, and the car starts up. You know, no one told me this, right? So I am sitting in this car. The guy said it's on, okay? And now with these vehicles, you don't hear if it's on, it's off because it's electric. There's no engine. So I'm like, okay, if it's on, how do I turn it off? I sat here for a good 15 minutes. I'm like, I'm not this dumb. It's a vehicle. There must be an on-off switch somewhere here. Eventually, I had to concede defeat. I went and I asked Sarah and she came out and she said, you just push this button here and it cuts the power. So there is an off button to turn the entire thing off, but it isn't labeled on or off. It has this unique symbol on it. And that's the thing with electric vehicles. You have to get used to a whole new set of symbols, especially here and on your dash. The dash is on and I'm looking at this dash and I'm like, okay, let me see. Let me see if I can figure out what this is, what that is, what that is. It's not like cars before where your dash is clean and if a light pops up, something is wrong. There are lights on constantly here and nothing is wrong. It's just typical with electric vehicles and most modern vehicles. Now let's go over to the touchscreen slash infotainment system. And no, the screen isn't already scratched. That's a screen protector over the screen. Now where some vehicles tend to fall behind is having complex and laggy user interfaces. This doesn't suffer from that. As you can see, I touch something and it responds right away, almost in real time. This is what you want from a vehicle. Think about it, if you were to purchase a cell phone, 4,000, 3,000, 2,500 and it lags, you will say to yourself, this phone is slow and outdated. So if you won't accept it for a cell phone that costs 4,000, 5,000, why would you accept it for a vehicle that's costing 300,000, 200,000, 150,000? You get the point. And this vehicle proves that you can have a speedy, snappy interface. I need you to also note that you can actually see the screen. This was at midday. The sun is directly overhead, beating down on this vehicle. Clear as far as the eye can see. Now I understand that there are times and rules to shoot in vehicles. You have the golden hours, early in the morning, late in the afternoon. The dealership isn't available late in the afternoon and I'm not waking up early in the morning. So high noon will have to do. And you can still see the screen. Even though there's glare all over, the screen is bright enough that you can still see it. So not only is it responsive, snappy, you can also see it in direct sunlight. Now me just going through the interface here isn't doing how much tech this vehicle is really packed with justice. So let me just rattle off some of them here really quickly so you can get a better sense for how much technology they were able to pack into this vehicle. In terms of safety, listen to this list. You have dual front airbags, front side airbags, a center airbag, curtain airbags, front seat belts with pre-tensioner, driver and passenger, rear seat belts with pre-tensioner, left and right. You have electronic stability control. You have traction control. You have secondary collision mitigation, roll movement intervention, hill start assist control, tire pressure management system, rear parking sensors, your 360 degree camera system, adaptive cruise control with stop and go, intelligent cornering control, emergency lane keep, rear cross traffic alerts, forward collision warning, lane departure warning, lane keep assist, lane center keeping, Automatic braking, pedestrian, cyclist, and crossing, traffic sign recognition, lane change assist, rear collision warning, door open warning, traffic jam assist, driver drowsiness detection, and isofix. And that was just in the safety category. It's like when they were in the boardroom conceptualizing what to put in this car, they were like, hey, we're short on time, lunch is just now, put everything. Let's not, you know, pick and choose what to put. You put in everything. The only three things that this particular model doesn't have, but the GT version that's coming does, Power tailgate, a sunroof, heater steering wheel. And when the GT version does arrive, it will legit have everything because it will have those three things and then some things like front parking sensors. This one does not have front parking sensors, only at the It may be a small, goofy looking car on the outside, but you could never say that it's missing stuff or that the build quality isn't top notch. You're going there, sitting it, you poke, you push, you prod, you try to twist. Everything is just well built and stable. There are no creaks and rattles and unnecessary things that you would expect in a vehicle when you hear it's a Chinese vehicle. But let's see how it drives. 
because all of this could fall apart if it drives like shit. So let's take it out onto the road and see how it drives. So after some brief mirror adjustments, it was time to set off. Now the song you're hearing there, 99.9% .9 is the AC. The AC was on full blast. Like I said, the car was parked in the sun. It was 12 o'clock. The sun was beating down on it. We had to cool down. Other than that, the vehicle is silent as you would expect an electric car to be. Perfect. Nice. Wait, lower, lower. No, good. It didn't take too long to get cool, we lowered the fan speed, it was back to silence and we were off. Now if you notice, we are going in between two vehicles here and the 360 camera auto turns on. And it turns off when you pass. When you make a sharp right turn or a sharp left turn, again the camera comes on. Because it's assuming you are turning somewhere and you need to see what is to the left if you are making a left turn. Or what is to the right if you are making a right turn. So anytime you turn the steering wheel sharply to one side or the other, the 360 camera turns on, it doesn't stop the music, it doesn't interrupt anything, it just turns on at a glance, you can see, okay, I'm going to hit that curb, let's not do that. Now pay attention to how wide these windows are on the doors every time I look left or right. Granted, I am shooting in wide angle, which tend to distort images a bit, but these windows, because of the shape of the top of the car, they are really large. You are literally sitting like you are in a fishbowl. You have no reason to say somebody was in your blind spot, because the blind spots here, minimal. Now, as you can see, we turned out onto the highway into traffic. That Friday, there was traffic heading into Port of Spain, which just ruined the drive. But aside from that bummer, pay attention to the screen once more. Notice, as I start turning the steering wheel, or I turn the indicator on, left or right, look at this. The screen turns on. It doesn't flicker on. It doesn't stutter on. It just turns on. When you straighten up, it turns back off. But let's talk about the cooler stuff for a moment. The specs. How is the performance? How does it feel to drive? Well, let's talk about the range first things first. It has a theoretical max range of 420 kilometers on a full charge. Now that full charge is going to take roughly about 8 hours to charge to 100%. To the front left of the vehicle, you have where the charging takes place. You push and you pull this little thing and it opens up and reveals the two plugs. One is your normal charging, which you will use and it is recommended you use this one the most because it's 11 kilowatts. It takes about 6.5 hours to get the vehicle from 10 to 80 percent. And then you could rapid charge it, which will get same 10 to 80 percent, but just in 50 minutes. But like with all other batteries, if you constantly rapid charge, rapid charge, rapid charge, you prematurely degrade the battery. So it's advised that you just let the vehicle charge overnight while you sleep. It's going to take 6.5 hours from 10 to 80%. You're going to be good to go after that. But if you're in a pinch and you need the extra power, then you can use the rapid charger and charge it up in about 50 minutes. But what is all of this going to cost? How much will it cost additional to your bill every single time you recharge this vehicle right up? Well, lucky for us here in TNT, we still have relatively low electricity costs, even with the rate increases coming from January 1st, 2024. So on average, you'll be paying between $21 and $25 to fully charge this vehicle. Now to get the same amount of range in a typical gasoline vehicle, let's say 450 kilometers, you have to spend at least 260 ish dollars 260 super maybe about 280 premium to get that same distance but with this you are paying just about 21 to 25 dollars and you're getting that range in an electric vehicle and you never have to see the gas station again when you look at the raw numbers it does seem enticing aside from the higher starting cost for the vehicle because three hundred and forty nine thousand dollars you will now have to decide your driving habits is it worth your while but the share numbers by themselves the numbers do look enticing you do pay less per mile or per kilometer than you would with a gasoline vehicle now when it comes to performance on the road for a small vehicle like this it is going to put a lot of bigger vehicles to shame just look at the horsepower on the top rating it has 168 horsepower and 184 foot pounds of torque Right off the bat, that is faster than the Nissan Notes, the Nissan Kicks, the Toyota Aquas, the Fielder Wagons, the Axios. It even has more power than the average Elantra, the Serato. It is ranking up there with something like a turbocharged Tucson. The Tucson has about 180 something horsepower or thereabout, and this one has 168. However, this one has 184 foot pounds of torque, which is just about the same 
as a turbocharged Tucson. And because this is electric, you get that power instantly. You don't have to build boost, you don't have to do anything. Hit the accelerator pedal and hold on and it shoots off. Let's see what that looks like. Now unfortunately, because of the traffic, I couldn't take it out onto the main highways, so I had to utilize these back roads and side streets. So I couldn't give it full beans in that demonstration there. But just that small test, you already saw how quickly it got up there. It got up there so quickly, it was literally trying to spin its wheels. You could hear the traction and control trying to keep the wheels from spinning. That is how much torque it has. If you took traction control off, you could break traction really, really easy and spin up the wheels. That is the amount of power this car is pushing. Now as you can see, this road here isn't the best. Now I'm not jumping into all these big holes but some of them are unavoidable. Like I said we had to utilize back roads because the main roads were blocked. Now I'm driving here and I'm taking it pretty slow but I'm still listening for any creaks and rattles because even a new vehicle, if it's poorly designed, you can still hear slight creaks and rattles as the vehicle chassis flexes as it goes over humps and holes and stuff and this one just seems to handle it. That being said, when you are going around roundabouts like this or a sharp bend or a turn, you do feel the mass. And it's not to say the vehicle is overweight, it's just that your brain thinks it's going to be lighter given the size, but then you realize, okay, it's a bit heavier. For example, I'm turning the steering wheel here, and you can see I turned, and then I had to turn even more because I'm like, okay, I'm drifting too much to the center line, and I keep turning more. And I think that's because of two things. Because of the heavy battery, even though it's down low, you still feel that extra mass. And also, given the fact that the suspension is tuned soft, it's not trying to be a sporty vehicle. So there is a bit of body roll. Not excessive, but there is body roll. Plus, I'm fat. I'm like 250 pounds. So by myself, I and all have the suspension under some pressure. But other than that, it's a nice, quiet drive when it wants to be. And I say when it wants to be because it beeps at you every so often. Like, if you get too close to the vehicle in front, beep, 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 beep. I can see a lot of drivers turning this off because it beeps at you for everything. It's not a bad thing, it's just a bit too aggressive. Granted, there are some settings where you have low, medium, high, so I guess you can lower the sensitivity of it, but in this current state of I was driving it there, it was a bit too sensitive. This would be a good time to point out the one pedal driving. Every time I stopped in this clip so far, I didn't hit the brake. Just like in the Sun Kicks, the e-power technology, electric cars, it has single pedal driving where you take your foot off the gas pedal and it will come to a stop using regen. Remember this acceleration test I did earlier on? All I did was take my foot off the gas and the regen kicked in and the vehicle came to a slow enough speed where I can take the corner. It's really aggressive in its highest setting, but you can either switch it off completely or leave it on low, medium or high. What you are seeing here is the vehicle mapping out the road ahead. The vehicle directly in front of me is the Prado you were seeing earlier on. And as you can see, it's seeing the white lines, it's seeing the cars to my right up ahead. And if your vehicle were to enter my blind spot left or right, you're going to see a yellow outline letting me know that a vehicle is in my blind spot on what side. Now this vehicle has adaptive cruise control. So if the vehicle in front slows down or stop, it will slow down or stop and get going again for itself. As you can see, it's detecting everything behind me. And if you look at your side mirror, you will see the conventional light that most vehicles have now letting you know a vehicle is in your blind spot. So it also has that in case you're wondering. So you can either look here, you can look using a glass, old school, or you can look on the dash. But just swivel ahead and use your mirrors now. Be a driver. Now when it comes to the 360 camera, it's so high resolution, you can see the cracks and indentations on the ground. You literally... It's already a smaller vehicle, so you shouldn't even be bouncing anything to begin with. But let's say, let's just say that, you know, you know, you're not really up there when it comes to driving. You have guidelines. 
for the front and rear. This is something that I've only seen on a high-end BMW before now. You can see the blue, well, the green line in front is for the front, and then you have the guidelines to the back, which is showing you in this yellow here. So you can not only see where the front wheels are going to go, but you can also see where the rear wheels are going to go. Because sometimes they're clearly front, but the rear is the problem child in the family. But here I am back at the dealership. Now I must say, I was really impressed by this little car. I came into this blind. I didn't know what an aura was before. I have never driven one. I only got permission to do this review the same week. And then I came, so I didn't have time to even do research. So I came into this blind and I was winging it the entire way. As you all saw, I didn't even know how to turn the vehicle off. I had to ask for assistance. Hi, how do you turn this car off? It was embarrassing, but say what? All in all, I was really impressed by what I saw. I was impressed by how the vehicle drove. And I think this is a case of the Chinese building parts for everybody else all these years. And they're deciding, you know what, we could do it too. You know, we're already building all the components for your cars. And you all get any credit, so you might as well just build our own. Because let's not pretend that everything we own don't come from China. You know, you might bad talk your Chinese and say the Chinese can't build good things, but the iPhones are built in China, and look at the quality of the iPhones. Samsungs are built in China, and look at the quality of Samsung flagships. So the Chinese know how to build quality products when they have to, like this vehicle here. Unfortunately, the world likes cheap things, and they tend to build a lot of cheap things to satisfy the world's need for cheap things. So they are known for building cheap, inferior products. But when they have to build something of quality, they know how to step up like they did with this vehicle, but don't take my word for it alone. Find somebody who owns one, or go into a dealership, play around with it, see if you like it, who knows, you may. The two things I would change about this would be that logo, that logo is too big and distracting, and that minimalistic design for the interior, I'm never a fan of the minimalistic design. I don't like it in Teslas, I don't like it here as well. I like buttons and dials and stuff, but I understand what they were going for here. As few buttons as possible, and they pulled it off, 